All righty. I see some folks are still flowing in here, but I think for the sake of time, and we want to save some uh, room for questions and answers at the end, so I'm going to say go, and we're going to get started on this webinar. Uh, hi, I'm Greg Paulson, and uh, well, uh, welcome to our webinar on the best practices for metal 3D printing through binder jetting. So this is a webinar uh, that is hosted by Zometry, but also features a special guest from X1. Uh, we're really excited to talk about this novel 3D printing technology, uh, how it's used, why would you, would you use it, and some design principles behind it. Uh, but before we get going in the conversation, uh, let's just you know have some introductions here. Uh, so again, I am Greg Paulson. I am the Director of Application Engineering here at Zometry. Uh, and I lead, I lead our application engineering team, which are essentially consultants. We uh, help uh, customers uh, look at projects, help the help understand and engineer some of the uh, sale the sales topics needed, uh, as well as uh, looking at DFM, uh, choosing that best process, the best material, and why that will be better for this pro this stage of the project. Uh, this project, I've been working in advanced manufacturing since 2007, running machines for many years, uh, as well as through my previous career uh, previous career and uh, work in mostly applied additive manufacturing, but also have experience with molding, casting, uh, machining, sheet metal, you name it. Uh, we've, we've had our hands on some parts here at Zometry. And I am very, very excited to introduce Brandon Carey, uh, who will be co-hosting uh, this event. Uh, Brandon is the technical application manager at X1. Uh, Brandon serves uh, as technical application manager for the early adoption center at X1. Uh, he's worked with them for over eight years, covering roles from designer, application engineer, and sales. His focus is helping customers adopt binder jetting manufacturing. Brandon has also collaborated on patents, achieved business leader awards, has been featured on MSNBC Business Week for supporting additive manufacturing. Uh, Brandon received a bachelor's degree in industrial design from the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. Brandon, do you got your camera on? Let me see if I can get you there. I'm here. All right, there you are. Sweet. All right. Yeah, thanks, so Brandon, thanks for the introduction. introduction. Uh, nice to meet everybody. Looking forward to it. Yeah, this is this has been a really great event, and I always say these when we do these webinars about these technical topics. It's exciting for me too because you know I've used these parts, but there's always more to learn, and uh, and there's there's little nuances of every single process that you can really um, really learn from the experts. And Brandon's been you know literally elbow deep in this industry to to some points here. So it's just really, really exciting to have them on board. So what are we going to be talking about today? Uh, well, uh, first off, we're going to say, what is it? So what is binder jetting? We're going to talk about the benefits of binder jetting. We're going to go through materials and finishes that are that you can uh, regularly get with binder jet processes, as well as uh, some design nuances. And uh, that's going to go full circle. We'll show you why in just a second here. And uh, we really want to finish off with live Q&A. So that's my plug uh, for the audience here. Uh, as you're listening, if there, you have any questions, we love answering questions. So please feel free to use that question tab, uh, ask a question along the way. Um, I'm going to try to grab as many as I can at the end of this, as well as if there's any overflow, I'm going to be wor uh, working uh, to answer those afterward as well. So. Yeah, let's just jump right into this and go with what is binder jetting. And Brandon, we have a video I'm going to show, and if you want to narrate through, but we'll we'll walk through just kind of this process, like how you know what is what is this 3D printing process? Yeah, absolutely. You know, at, at, the, at a high level, you know, binder jetting is a item manufacturing process in which we use liquid uh, liquid bonding agent to join powder. Um, and if you were watching the video here. Essentially, what's happening is you're spreading powder across a print bed, um, and you're also using a liquid binding agent, and that, that's happening intermittently back and forth, building the part and layers, much like any other 3D printing aspect. Um, what you see right here is our triple ACT, which is an advanced compaction technology, which is a patent technology, which basically what it means is it's all about bringing deviation down across the print bed. That's very, very critical when you're talking about Bonder jetting, which is printing, and then there's always a thermal operation uh, on the on the back end of the process. And so binder jetting, it's it's making these uh, these parts here, and just talking about the process and its history. I mean, how long has X1 been working in the binder jetting technology, like the ad that additive manufacturing space? Uh, technology we acquired from MIT in 1995, um, and we've been utilizing that technology for a very long time. 
Um, when we started off, the technology we bought was specifically the infiltration process or the composite process. And over time, we've advanced into you know, single alloy manufacturing, which is just one material rather than um, the lower melting point material. Awesome, awesome. And so let's just take a closer look. So we saw the video kind of walking through, but can you can you detail kind of these steps, like what happens to my CAD, what happens to those, those parts and the states uh, for all this manufacturing process? Absolutely, that's a dive deep. Um, so the, the first step is gonna be your digital file prep. Digital file prep is pretty critical. And during this file prep, you're essentially, you're gonna create a build layout that's, you know, you're nesting components together in order to optimize your build. Um, and you're also adding what we call stilts. And another terminology for that could be a screw if you're familiar with um, the casting industry. And basically what that stilt is doing, it allows that bronze or the lower melting material to be uh, wicked or infiltrated up into the skeletal structure of the component. So adding that in the digital aspect allows an easier removal in the post process. Um, you're also, just like any other added process, you're gonna to wanna to make sure your files are watertight and that way you don't pull parts out of the build and have any issues. Um, step two, of course, is build, where you saw the video previously where it's doing that uh, metal powder. And we're doing typically 50 to 100 micron layers at a time. Um, that changes depending on powder and powder sizes, et cetera. Um, and then the printhead will come out and get down a chemical binding agent. And that happens back and forth, building the part out completely from bottom to top. If you were to look down inside the build, it looks like there's nothing in there but powder. But you do have a component, you know, multiple components of different design or 10,000 of the same parts inside that build block. Now this this is interesting because I, I do compare this somewhat to laser sintering or multi-jet fusion, which are plastic 3D printing technologies we use, because you're not just confined to a build plate and, and growing parts uh, um, off of that build plate. You're also, um, you're able to essentially float these parts in that space. And that this this gray material here is, that's metal, right? So that's just a, a metal powder uh, right. that's positive through. Yeah. And so yeah, there's so a, you can, so go, ahead. go ahead. You can have components that are like the image in two, and you can also have another part that's directly sitting inside that component if you want to in order to optimize. Because it's all about optimization of your Z height uh, because that's going to lead to your throughput capability. No, that's that sounds really good. And and we talk about too, like there's a cure. So the binder actually needs to kind of set in place with the, with the metal. So there's a that step four is a actually a kind of almost like a pre-thermal cure, right? Correct. It's a, essentially it's a catalyzation process, which really just means it's giving you a part that's strong enough that you can physically handle. Um, after cure, when you go to the powder, you you have to remove or evacuate all the loose powder from around the component, and you're using air or using vacuum to do so. Uh, and the part has to be strong enough in that in that step in order to be able to remove the powder. If there's you know loose powder inside of the channels, etc. Uh, this is a pretty crucial part of the process for, for us. Um, and essentially, I mean, if you drop that component on the floor there, it's, it's weak enough that it will break. It's not yet to its metallurgical structure. Um, Makes sense. That doesn't happen until you go to step six, which is either that infiltration process or it's a high temp centering process. Yeah, and that's uh, and I th we're going to go into further details and what happens step six and even kind of beyond that. Uh, but you know, it's it's always under good to understand like what happens operationally in in making these parts. Uh, now, when we talked about this, and you're just you mentioned before, uh, this is this is really interesting to binder jet is I have a secondary stage, so I kind of create a green state part, and then I have my secondary first. And it's really interesting because this is going to lead us all the way down to our DFM guidelines uh, at the end of this webinar. Uh, so this green state part is kind of that initial stage. I can handle these parts, uh, but they're not fully sintered. They're not direct metal yet. So I can still kind of you know crush them in my hand, right? Uh, so you know what what for you like what is a green part? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, good question. Uh, so green part is essentially, you know, at a raw skeletal structure is only 55% dense and it's only held together with that liquid binder at that point. Um, 
So it's not, you know, to the phase where it's strong enough to be able to use at that structure and, you know, a functional wear characteristic environment. It's really only strong enough to allow you to flow air across it and gently hold it. You know, it's, you have to have a lot of ductility in order to, you know, handle the infrared body part. And, you know, what's, what's actually funny about the, you know, the hiring process here, I, I think it's always funny to tell. We always ask employees if they play video games and they're always afraid to answer. But at the end of the day, we want somebody that has that ductility, you know, to their, to their hands to be able to pick these parts up. Yeah. So like, yeah, can you, can you give a, give a gentle touch to these parts uh, to work through? And it, it's interesting. So way back in the day, uh, like the, I, I ran a center station, which is a, like a older version of SLS machine. And they, came with a sample metal set, which was this uh, kind of a plasticized or like kind of wax covered metal in a, in a powder form. And it would gently bond together, but it was the biggest pain to handle because the stuff would just essentially dissolve in your hands. So I worked on one metal project with that and I, you know, I, I was done <laughs> essentially. Um, all right, let me click through here. And by the way, Brandon, I'll, I'm going to walk through this. It, well, I'm getting some feedback on your mic uh, too, so I'm not sure if there's if you do have another mic or if it's if it's reading through. Okay. If not, we'll 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 wing with it. But just just a heads up there. Um, but I, you know, I just I'll I'll start walking through here if uh, if you like if there's anything you can troubleshoot. Uh, but uh, there's four end stages. So one of the things is whenever we talk about an additive manufacturing technology like SLS and MJF, for example, are in a powder bed fusion. Uh, same with direct metal sintering, for example, where it's using laser or heat source to fuse powder together. Uh, binder jetting is creating that net shape with a, some sort of binding agent around a substrate material. And then you are applying some sort of energy sometimes to create it to a secondary stage, but that's the umbrella of binder jetting. Uh, so with uh, with this, there's, there's four potential end stages that we go, uh, uh, that we can go through from bonded, porous, infiltrated, and highly centered. And Brandon, do you want to give a sound check now? It sounds a little bit better, at least. Uh, I'm not sure if. Uh, How's it sound? It sounds better. better. A little okay. bit better. It's a, we'll, we'll go with it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do this live. It's going live, guys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, do you want to walk through bonded to uh, highly centered? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So there's, you know, essentially, as Greg said, four stages of our process. And the first stage is this bonding aspect. And the bonded really is what we just talked about previously is a green part. Um, with binder jetting, we also have the capability to print sand as well in order to do sand cores and molds. And the sand cores and molds are essentially in this bonded phase as well. After print, they'll go directly to the foundry to get poured. Uh, the, the next phase is what we call this porous phase. Essentially, it's lightly centered. So we're taking that still, that green part, and taking that to a lower temp centering cycle. And essentially what that's going to output is something that could be used in filtration. So air filtration, water filtration, et cetera. And there's also other applications as well. In this stage, you know, there's other sand processes that you can utilize in the porosity in this pore stage as well. Uh, primarily what we do is this infiltrated product. Uh, so it's this 55% this you know, dense um, skeletal structure of stainless steel. And we're introducing a lower melting point material into this raw skeletal structure. Uh, it could be copper, it could be bronze, you know, anything that's a lower melting point than your raw material. Um, we use a lot of 400 series and 300 series stainless steel uh, and others as well. And then there's this highly centered product, which is a highly recognizable, you know, product in you know all the metal industry today which is going to be like a 316L or 17.4. The difference is going to be, one, we're using a smaller powder size in order to get a more uniform and higher density. So we're going as high as 98% dense, but your part's shrinking roughly 20% during that process. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things happening thermally and dynamically there in that highly centered process compared to the infiltrated process where you're seeing, you know, one to 2% shrinkage on average. Yeah, so this is, so essentially like I, what I'm holding here is that 420i, which is what we're auto quoting on Zometry site right now. And it, this this material is a stainless steel bronze hybrid. And, uh, you know, we'll go into details on that that composition. 
Uh, but the, from my CAD model to final geometry, you're not having too much shrinkage because essentially that that binding agent is, is getting replaced uh, by uh, a flowing bronze uh, material. And it's, it's really interesting because you talk about you're getting hot enough to melt bronze, but not hot enough to melt steel. It's still about 1100 degrees. So it's still pretty dang yeah. hot when you're doing the process of these parts. Yeah. And, and you know, just talking about this, so we have this process. We have a process that I can build, you know, batches of parts at a time. Um, I can make them in, you know, a metal infiltrated uh, pro product. Uh, and, you know, what are we seeing uses of uh, uh, across across the industry? Like, what do you see, uh, you know, day to day with um, uh, the biter jet process? Everything. <laughs> it, yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy how much different product line you can see and how much how many designers out there engineers out there just have this thought in their head about even you know replacement parts parts you can't find skews or product lines for today anything from automotive to heavy machinery to farm equipment this product that doesn't exist today that you can just take turn into a cad file and then you know turn into a functional product um, a lot of tooling fixtures jigs are utilized today um, molds for because the process gives you the availability to do internal chain internal channels for like cooling channels um, mm -hmm. and easily remove powder as long as it's you know accessible it, it's a it's a it's a really wide range of product lines we you know even do a lot of aftermarket stuff OEM product oil and gas goes is really really well it has worked for us forever we've been very successful in that business for as long as I can remember. Well, the eight plus years I've been here, so. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's something to note, uh, just kind of a, a preview of this. When you have like a, a material like 420i, it's, it is a metal matrix composite, which is kind of unique when you think about it. Uh, but it's, uh, one of the interesting aspects sometimes when you composite materials is you kind of get uh, the, the strengths of both parties. So. Uh, this has a bronze filtration that actually almost acts as a self-lubricating factor while it is wear resistant because of the steel component of this. So in a downhole drilling situation where you're churning up rock and you're actually the end of factor, you're the business end of this of these products, uh, a composite material actually may be more ideal than a direct material uh, in that case. And speaking of, let's talk about benefits. So, um, you know, we, we talked about what what is this, but, you know, what you know, what sets this apart as an additive manufacturing uh, process. Um, and I'll, I'll run through some of these, but I think first off, and this is for our listening audience here, like, you know, this is this is really strong metal. It is uh, the, the parts that you produce, like they are, they're solid metal pieces and actually the bronze kind of gives a nice, a nice heft to that as well. Um, and very durable, as we mentioned before, like these, these are end use functional materials. Uh, also, uh, in the image uh, the slide before, you saw this kind of necklace shape. Uh, you have a lot of advantages because like some of these plastic sintering processes that I described, you don't need support structures. That initial phase, the parts are kind of floating in space. And that means that some of the design considerations that you may have where you have to support areas or have internal channels, um, they're, they're much, much more flexible. <clears throat> so you're, you're able to have much higher design freedoms. Uh, with this particular metal 3D printing process. Also, because you're floating parts in space in this in this digital platform, uh, it can be one-offs or high volume. You could do a high, like either, you know, 300 of one piece or 300 individual pieces in a machine and you're printing those parts. So it has it has a lot of versatility, whether it is the one to thousands range. And like many 3D printing processes, you're printing only the material you need. The other materials were used. And actually, got a question for you on that. Is is that is is that true? Like any material that is not bound together is just kind of sits sits and filtered and reused again. The, That's yeah. correct. I, I would say, and that's actually on a yearly basis, we're really only utilizing roughly 10% of the build blocks is a physical part. The rest of that powder actually gets recycled back through our process. So the, you know the the low cost is driven from that as well. That makes sense, and that's what, yeah, that's definitely something we talk about. Is this is the this is the economical metal printing option by far? Um, again, without supports 
orientation is not too much of an issue and the layer sizes are small enough that uh, you don't have you know significant stair stepping uh, for example this part here um, you know my camera view you know was built actually this direction uh, but you know even on this gradual slope here which you know in a lot of processes you see a lot of stepping it's you know it's fairly consistent through and you could build larger parts uh, i think we are 15 by 10 inch by 10 inch our instant quoting uh, for the 420i uh, so it's just very good at combining uh, features into one part and creating parts with very, very high complexity. Um, and we'll go into this uh, a little bit later, but uh, it's also one of the few metal materials that I can go ahead and provide, you know, several different finishes for uh, to get some different cosmetic appearances on the part. So this is usually the question. And actually, I think I've seen some questions uh, uh, coming up already uh, about this, which we'll definitely uh, cover some more on the Q&A here, is how does this compare to other metal 3D printing processes? Uh, at Zometry, we instant quote eight unique uh, additive manufacturing processes. Uh, six of those are polymer-based, uh, two of those are metal-based. So that's gonna be metal binder jetting and direct metal laser sintering. Um, there's, you know, there are strengths and trade-offs to each one of those. Uh, and I could, I could definitely tell you one of the uh, biggest strengths I see with metal binder jetting over DMLS is that design freedom that can do because of uh, support consider considerations of DMLS. Uh, one of the, uh, here's just some high mix of different parts here that could all be built, you know, at the same time on, in, you know, large bulk build. With DMLS, uh, you have to consider how you're gonna support that. So here's an example of some DMLS aluminum parts that we've made in the past. Uh, this is essentially half of a glass of smart frame here. Uh, and the actual part is kind of these components and this, this frame component here. This stuff down here, which is just about the same mass of the part itself, is supporting structure. Uh, that usually requires secondary operations and kind of custom operations to, uh, to remove, and it may affect some of the details and cosmetics. So DMLS is extremely uh, uh, powerful when it comes to you know, tighter tolerances on the, on the get-go uh, from uh, compared to binder jet metal, for example, where you have plus or minus five thousand tolerance on you know, smaller parts with, and a little bit of creep on larger parts, but it's still pretty dang good. Uh, where binder jet, that post-thermal process usually has a deviation based on the shrink rate. So it's usually a percent uh, base of that. Uh, what, what else am I missing here? Kind of like, what are the comparison points that you usually see between DMLS and binder jet that, that kind of help you choose? Yeah, I think you, I think you hit on some great points there, Greg. And it, you're right, there are pros and cons between the process. And, you know, at, at the raw base of what binder jetting really capable of doing it's all about scalability it's about taking a, a build and doing you know 1000 of the different designs or doing you know 1000 of the same design and it's it's an iterative process so what we do even though our tolerance right out of the gate is not the same as a laser can be we go through iterations of scaling and iterations yeah. of, you know, essentially DFAM in order to key in on what, you know, the best binder jetting is achievable can achieve. Um, you know, and typically after that, sometimes it depends on the part size, of course, but sometimes we can get down to pop out. Um, it's yeah. really all about the the, you know, your end use consumer, what your application is going to be, you know, at the end of the day. And that's where you draw a line in the sand and say what direction you should go. And what makes sense for you if you have a decent if you have a nice budget and it's all about turn time and you need to be ready out of the gate then laser is the way to go but if you're talking about you know real scalable production then you know i think binder jetting really is the way to go yeah and when we talk about scalability again not being confined to the build plate on dmls and to your point yeah i can get if i'm doing you know one to three i can probably get them quicker with the dmls platform but as you go beyond that build plate so what i can fit on my build plate is my constraint all of a sudden you're adding another build and so you cap out very quickly because it's whatever can sit on typically a 10 inch by 10 inch table. Uh, it, with the binder jet, you have the nestability. So the process has its own steps to it that may take the same amount of time to build one as it would to be to build 100. Uh, but it's, it's very consistent and helps you scale a little bit. And by the way, I've seen some awesome questions coming in. I, I can't wait to you know, have some Q&A session with you, Brandon. So uh, please, uh, for all of you asking those questions, keep them coming. This is great. All right, so let's go in and uh, dive a little bit on uh, materials here. So, uh, you know, I've been mentioning this bronze infiltrated uh, uh, material here, uh, and we have, you know, we're really highlighting that because it is this commodity. 
And what we're calling that is it's X1 metal 420i. So it's a stainless steel bronze composite. And Brandon, if you want to kind of walk through a little bit of it, uh, I'm happy to, to chip in as well. But yeah, like, you know, what does this mean to you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it, it's like Greg said, it is a 60% stainless steel, 40% bronze component. Uh, we say 60, 40, but you know, it's really a 95% then. So obviously it's not completely 100%. Uh, the, the main functionality for this product really is about quick, fast, and cheap. The 400 series stainless steel is very inexpensive. It's fast. We're printing 100 micron layers. We're able to go through a belt furnace that's a nine hour centering cycle. Uh, so you can essentially turn parts realistically in you know 24 hours, depending on size, of course. Um, it is, it's all about you know quick, fast, and getting product out the door. And we utilize it a lot. There, there's customer bases that we turn parts within two days. There's customer parts that we do every single day, you know, dedicated builds. Um, and we're running 25, you know, machines with this material today. So it, it's all about um, just that real quick, easy product offering. Um, and we've been doing it, you know, for 20 some years. So it's, you know, it's kind of our bread and butter. Yeah, it's it's definitely the commodity, you know, low cost 3D metal option. And I, I'm seeing that too, uh, especially when you're help when you're kind of choosing. Uh, sometimes it's actually not choosing between Biter Jet and DMLS. It's about do I print this metal part or machine it? And uh, and a lot of times, like especially like on some smaller parts, when there's an extra axes and other features, binder jetting actually becomes extremely compelling. Uh, I have this little piece, actually I have it over here, uh, you know, just a smaller piece like this. And this is, you know, a metal 3D printed part, you know, end use application. And it costs me, you know, I think between like 35, 40 bucks. You know, it's, it's really, really inexpensive to produce these these small true metal parts, uh, it's, you know that becomes a very compelling argument when you're when you're designing and and uh, you know making uh, making some systems. Uh, I actually had some questions. Uh, like I saw some questions. You mentioned this uh, this density, um, and uh, so this material is 95% dense, which means that you have your suspended steel steel and you have bronze that's infiltrating up, and there's there may be some porosity there of less than five percent. But it's not like a cast porosity where there may be a bubble, right? It's it's, yeah. it's very consistent across the the part. So you have it's more of a consistent property, right? Because you're you're not it's not it's not casting, right? It's not flowing like a casting where the screws and the gates and you're not, where you're pouring is is what's so critical about how you can contain porosity. The porosity really is, like you said, you know, sporadic throughout the whole entire component. And it's because we're using it's powder metallurgy, um, and it's you know. It's really on a microscopic level more so than am I going to you know dig into this part and see a, a porosity pocket? No, you're not going to do that. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it's something interesting here. And the last thing I want to note on this page, uh, we were we were speaking yesterday. And I added this last bullet here because I thought it was pretty cool. I always like to use analogies, and it's interesting because you're talking about a metal matrix composite. Uh, so sometimes it becomes difficult to, to describe what that is because it's not really 420 stainless steel and it's not really bronze. What is it? And so I, I like the comparison, very similar properties of 4140. So if you have that kind of in your mind, uh, it'll help you understand, you know, kind of the where and how and, and what it should behave like. Yeah, and when I when I talk when we're talking to customers, it's it's really about okay, what's your end use application? What material do you use today? Let's line up material for material properties and see what makes sense. Um, now your your elongation will be low because like I said earlier, it's it's powdered metal and that's just the nature of the beast. Um, but you know, it's really about the functionality of the product. Why are you using why are you using 4140 today? Why are you using 174 today? Uh, is it necessary? Is it just something that you had, you know, those bar stuff that was cheaper as a bar saw? Yeah, absolutely. And these are just some other examples uh, showing a mixture of you, know, you can make mechanical goods, uh, but you can really, really express design freedom. Uh, with these, so we have you know a putter and here, and I yeah, I will joke. I see that they like integrated a lattice, but they kept like these little hanging ends, which I'm just gonna say you don't necessarily need to do, but you know it's there. <laughs> uh, uh, but you can also go a little bit more artistic, and I actually have to say um, this climb bottle design I think was one of the first times I I saw a binder judge style metal print. So this is kind of like a you know, all time classic design uh, showing that there are rules. 
like any manufacturing process, there are rules, uh, but they're very different than the rules that you have with traditional manufacturing uh, for, for designing. And you can do very cool designs like this. And it's, they're actually, in a lot of ways, easier to do than some chunkier f uh, features. Uh, so I, I just always like to show off that, that level of complexity. Uh, I mentioned finishes, and these are finishes that actually you can, on Zometry site, when you upload your part, you can select binder jetting, that 420i, uh, get instant pricing. And under finishes, we have six available. Uh, so the standard finish and the part that I've been kind of holding up here, that's, that's a Zerblast finish. Uh, so that is a uh, that is a bead blast finish that is I believe it's a like what is a coating ceramic or something like that that will um, that actually gives a nice kind of brightening of the part. It really does make that that bronze show through, which is why you have that very bronzy look. But it's clean and matte, uh, and it gives a gives an overall even finish to the part. Um, for each one of these matte finishes, there's kind of a counterpart too. So you have Zerb blast here. Uh, if you Zerb blast and have a post thermal treat in, in one sort of way, you get this wheat penny finish, which brings you more to a kind of a darker copper tone. Uh, I'm a big fan of also the Damascus the Damascus finish, which will take the material and bring it to you know what I would consider a non-reflective charcoal uh, style finish. So you know you get very good detail. Uh, and I do like that finish a lot there. And that's another post, post heat treat essentially to, to apply a patina. On, on those, they can also be tumbled. Uh, so you have the, the opposite of each one of these is a tumble version. So Zerblast, uh, you can tumble polish the, uh, that to bring, a, bring more of a brighter shine to the part. Uh, so you can do that with, so for example, antique bronze, what I have right here, you could bring it to shine. Note that this is a vibratory media tumble uh, this process. So wherever the media can hit the material is where you're going to see that that polishing. Where it doesn't, it'll look more matte. So like in, in inside like this V-shaped feature, for example, you're still going to have more of a matte surface uh, to it. But you can see this the prominent text really shines out because it's being tumbled. Uh, and between that is still remaining that matte finish. Uh, and medieval pewter is that, that darker material uh, being shined out. Uh, other thing to note on the medieval pewter is you will see some of that brighter bronzy look on anything that's really external and getting polished more. It's just going to shine. It's just going to shine more, so you're, you're going to see a brighter uh, appearance to it. Um, this is also something to note that this is not like just a standard tumbler, right? You like this material, as we noted before, is highly wear resistant. So I think you guys have you know the mother of all tumblers that's in in your shop that's bringing these to a uh, to a media finish. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a it's a very aggressive piece of equipment uh, to the point where the metal's hot when you pull it out. Um, what it's doing is it's basically rotating the part at high velocity, actually twofold, so the whole entire unit rotates, and then there's multiple buckets inside of it that also rotate. Um, and the reason being, you know, just as you alluded to, that this material is a strong material. You really have to beat it down in order to get, you know, this higher shine. Um, Tricks of the trade that we'll do is we've at, at a, after we tumble in liquid and media, we'll actually go to a corn cob or a walnut, you know, tumbling process. And those have rouge embedded in them, actually. So it'll mm -hmm. give this like product a higher sign. It's pulling the rouge off the product, off the itself, and putting it directly on the product. Um, uh, one thing, one thing I did want to point out that's always everyone always asks. Um, when you see, if you look at the antique bronze next to the Zerblast, Zerblast component, you can see print lines more definitively in the in the bra, in the uh, AB. And the reason being, as you do essentially tumble this component, it will actually expose your print line uh, more so than the than the matte finish will. So everyone always asks, can I eliminate you know print lines, which are my favorite thing about the material most of the time myself. But you know, realistically, you have to go to a buffing operation if you really want to remove that. Yeah, and and that's you're also you're buffing a stainless steel, you know, 420 work hardening material. Uh, and I will note that on post processing this, that's something to consider is if you are adding taps or other features, uh, post, like after you receive your part, uh, you're going to want to use a, a a tap that is uh, that is usually a higher grade for a harder metal. Um, because if you use the tap that you use to like do a car repair or something like that, you may find a stuck tap inside your part because it'll work harder on you as you as you're turning the, the tool. 
Um, so we mentioned stilts at the very beginning, and I did want to point out uh, some, some areas here. Every single bronze infiltrated part is going to have a feature where that stilt that was designed in uh, by an operator, uh, you know, like X1, uh, Brandon may be designed as in uh, personally, actually, sometimes. Uh, and uh, those, those are used to infiltrate and create a conduit, like a runner for injection mold tool to, to bring that, uh, that bronze material into the steel part. Uh, but then they are removed afterwards and the, the features are ground down. So if you're looking at your parts and you're seeing a surface that has that sanded look to it, that's likely where that stilt is. And that's going to be 100% of the parts. Uh, but you know, I think the team is you're you're pretty considerate on where you're putting those, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, we'll try to always. Of course, we don't know what the end use of the product is all the time, but if we see something that's recognizable, we'll always try to hide the stilt and put it in a location that we know will be you know on the base or be hidden. If we're looking at rings, we'll try to hide it on the back end of the ring or the inside of the ring. Um, we try to stay away from putting stilts on round edges if possible, because it's not so easy to form metal with a drum or tool, you know, as it is to print it, of course. Uh, so we're basically, you know, just really always trying to look out for the best location. And, you know, stilt size is also contingent on overall part size because you have a you know, specific gram weight of bronze that you have to introduce into the component to make sure it's fully infiltrated. So that's also, you know, critical as well. Yeah, and stilts, they're not, just like the other parts of this process, they're not orientation dependent. So uh, you can actually put them in places where they're not gonna affect the build because it's not like support structure where in order to grow my part, I just, I just need to put something there to make a physical space. And I did wanna note, like I have uh, this part that I keep on holding up. It actually, you can see multiple locations on this. And this is very similar to almost injection molding and gating strategy where I may do a center gate and, and uh, actually, you know, make little uh, tines out to each, each one of these sections so you get a cleaner infiltration of, uh, across the part there. So you said like longer parts, you may actually go meet in the middle, right? Stilt on each side and let the bronze switch right. through and kind of, I mean, middle. The longer parts we'll try to do, you know, both locations depending on the overall length. What you were just talking about, we actually call the bicycle stilt. And essentially, you know, the aspect behind that is that we just want to keep that part as concentric as possible. So you want to infiltrate it from the center. If we were just to put, you know, essentially a stick on the side of that, you would actually see an elongation. So we're, you know, pretty, Interesting. pretty stringent about what we, how we infiltrate. Interesting. Um, and now let's talk about uninfiltrated materials. So this was something that when I, when I started working in binders at metal, uh, you know, about a, gosh, when I started get, start getting projects, was, I, I think before Zometry was my first experience with binders at metal, this wasn't a thing, and now it's a thing. So let's talk about single alloys uh, for a second. Yeah, for sure. Uh, this is exciting, and this is the future. You know, um, so what we're doing is we transitioned. We didn't get away from it by any means, obviously, but we've transitioned into a focus where we're looking at a, a finer micron powder size and a finer layer thickness in order to have, you know, a better resolution output. And it's a single alloy product, so it's only one material. And the post process, you know, essentially after print, so during print, actually, we have to scale the part up 15 to 20%, depending on the geometry of the part and the size. And then during centering, it's actually shrinking 20%. The output of this product is, you know, my most favorite part and the best part about it is we're hitting what they call MPRF 35 specs, which is a metal injection molding spec. So that's kind of, you know, the biggest focus is try to get that lower volume metal injection molding parts or try to, you know, semi compete with investment casting at, at lower volumes. We're just trying to capture that, you know, little bucket of uh, parts under 10,000 that we can, you know, capture. No, absolutely. And I think that's a really interesting market, especially with single alloys. And it's something, you know, I think we're you know, really excited uh, for here as well. Um, I had a question. I think I, this is something I've seen uh, on the on the Q&A as well. Um, when we talk about shrink rates, uh, you, you are scaling the, the CAD model. So part of that prep, that step one, is you're, you're scaling the CAD model for these different material classes. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. And it's, it's critical. We look at it. It's a percentage base based on the overall size, and it's just, you know, uh, a calculation, essentially. Yeah. Now, when you step into the single alloy, it's, 
it feeds into a thermal operation as well. So there's actually software out there that exists and there's you know 10 to 15 to 20 different companies creating the software that we're working with in order to figure out you know the centering simulation. Uh, that's a, that's a great question. So it's not it's it's uniform but it's it's almost pre or or you're you're creating uh, live setters so kind of little features that'll help it center at a at a uniform rate. Um, and just something to note too, and you know, we, we were mentioning tolerances earlier on this, uh, you know, for a bronze level traded uh, unit like 420i, which is the commodity material that, that we offer at Zometry, it's usually the target is at plus or minus 1% uh, tolerance. Because you do have 15 to 20% shrink rate on these uh, single alloys, usually the tolerance for those uh, is, is going to be targeting about plus or minus 2.5%. Uh, so That's something just to, just to keep in mind. Um, but this is also like to your point like if your goal is to start building into a production viable unit usually these processes have iterative tuning steps so you're you may create a part measure create offsets of your own uh or work with team members to make sure that we're tuning the part to hit your overall critical tolerances uh speaking of critical things let's talk about design here uh, so this is like the last section that we have uh when we're talking about binder jetting and first off we we do have this area, this build, this build area of 15 inches by 10 inches by 10 inches, um, but you have other considerations. So it's not just can I build a, you know, a chunk of metal. It's what's going to happen afterwards and how how is that going to survive? Um, best practices are to work on semi-uniform wall thicknesses. You could get away with some stuff here, but it's it's still best practice to keep it uniform. Uh, for uh, some of the post-processing infiltration, as well as those thermal characteristics, because this part's going to bake afterwards. Um, one millimeter is usually the minimum rule. And a lot of that is survivability. That green stage of that part uh, means that those smaller features can be very, very fragile. So I could take my finger and poke it and break it. Uh, so you want to make, you want to design your part with features that can be either self-supporting or robust, and try not to go below one millimeter uh, if at all possible, and that includes text. Arial 26, right? The reason why it's Arial 26 is you know the thickness of that text happens to be just right around the millimeter. So that's that's why you see that Arial 26 on our design guides, uh, as well as like in this in this presentation. The other thing to note with any additive process is uh, that knife edges are need to be either made by you afterwards. Um, but you don't want to print them. When I am cutting material, I'm able to remove from a block of material and cut down to an, an infinite point. When I'm growing material, I'm working with particles that have a finite size. And when I'm centering those together, uh, they're always going to have a finite size of them, so you can never get down to that infinite point. And even worse, you're getting below that millimeter minimum, so they may flake off during post-process and kind of you know, give you a bad day. Uh, you, you'll get a rough edge on it, but for DMLS, for SLS, for MJF, for PolyJet, for SLA, for binder jet, and anything beyond, knife edges are just not a good practice uh, in your design stage uh, for uh, for 3D printing. And one of my favorite practices for all 3D printing design is radii, though. Radii the heck out of this thing. Go for it. Uh, it's it's uh, it's basically you can't go wrong with radii. Um, so we mentioned this, uh, your post-processing, you, um, these features must survive this green state and the furnace stage. Um, one of the things you need to think about too is, you know, gravity exists, this material, it's, it's stainless steel, it's got density to it. So when you are, um, and Brandon, if you want to go into the details, like if I have a, like an impeller design or something that has, you know, internal features, I still need to get the other material out, right? Because if anything's left in there, it's just it just becomes metal. Is that correct? That's yeah. correct. <clears throat> if you consider, you know, this is like we said that 55% dense part and still really fragile. As you are removing powder from inside this part, you have to consider how you're going to remove that. So there has to be an access hole. That access hole has to be, you know, a specific size depending on your can your chamber size, your channel size. And also consider that you're utilizing air. And as you are trying to evacuate, you know, powder from these holes, you can essentially erode the part as well. So you have to be, you know, very careful with, you know, how you, your part is designed specifically to remove that powder. Yeah, and absolutely. And I, I don't have the note here, but uh, 
you know, even internal channels, making sure that you're thinking about if I'm blowing air in here, is there any place where it'll just like hit an edge and kind of go crazy, create a lot of turbulence? It's something to understand when you're creating features for clearing as well, uh, that any place where there's gonna be turbulence, you could uh, automatically uh, almost put an inheritable design or a consistency uh, in, a, in a place where it's very hard to inspect. Uh, so by creating, you know, gradual contours, adding internal radii, so say I have a chamber that's, you know, internal and squared off, uh, radii those internal features, and that'll help material clear out better and keep those edges from being trapped or inconsistent across, uh, from product to product. Um, and let's talk about the furnace stage too. So we talked a little bit about the fragile stage. Uh, what's happening in the furnace and uh, just kind of talk through some of those design tips. Yeah, so actually some of the design considerations that you utilize for removing powder actually are also leveraged from the application process. So elimination of the hard 90s is really crucial in that powder, in a, that implication flow, that bronze flow. Um, I use the analogy if you have two pipes that are square that are welded together at a 90 degree angle and you're trying to force water down the tubes, what happens at the inside edge of that you know, with that water, you see some turbulence, a little turbulence to something thermally, then that could be any type of hairline fracture or anything can happen there. Whereas if you take a single tube that's round and bend it, you know, on a bending machine and force water down through that, it's going to have a consistent flow. So your bronze is essentially doing the same aspect. So that's why those internal angles are so critical to eliminate those hard 90s. Not only will it cause, cause turbulence with the, with the um, bronze, it'll also essentially kind of push and pull at that at that T intersection and, and could cause some deformation. Yeah, and this is something that is just it's interesting because what, what we're talking about for clearing is kind of the same rules in reverse, right? So uh, where you know you have stuff that essentially instead of a conduit that's moving through, it's it's moving through the part itself. Uh, so anywhere that you can add radii as well as other access areas. So for example, this this uh, center kind of washer safe feature here there's a lot of ways for infiltra infiltrating material to actually access these features. Um, that all helps, you know, to, to make sure that your part gets a very consistent overall, uh, the final state. Um, something to note, and, I, and I'll say this again, like it's not unique to this, but anything that's long, uh, especially if it doesn't have self-supporting features like C shapes, for example, that can, uh, you know, kind of create a, a structure in that design, um, long aspect ratio parts in a, th in a thermal stage, they can warp or distort. So if you have something that's kind of uh, elongated and wispy in shape, and it, even if it follows like some of these technical guidelines, there may be things that happen as a bronze is moving into the part, uh, or just the fact that it's, it's uh, you know, in a heated state and it's not, you know, bonded down to anything that may cause some deflection, warp, or distortion on those parts. Uh, so something just to consider um, especially on, you know, very, you know, longer, uh, high aspect ratio uh, pieces. So first off, keep the questions coming. This is awesome. I, I'm just so excited. I have a lot of questions for you, Brandon. So uh, we're going to be, oh, we're going to be uh, running through some of them, uh, but please keep the questions coming. We're happy to talk about binder jet uh, processes and just anything you want to know. Uh, that's what we're here for today. Um, I got a few more slides here, and they're talking about, you know, where can I get parts, right? So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm with Zometry, and this is, you know, our Zometry presentation, but we are a on-demand manufacturing marketplace. Uh, it, we have a one-stop shop, if you will, for getting over a dozen different manufacturing technologies that ranges from 3D printing technologies like uh, this metal 3D printing process, as well as seven others that instantly quote online uh, based on just seconds after your CAD upload as well as things like CNC machining, uh, injection molding, urethane casting, sheet metal fabrication. We are here to make parts. Uh, we've, uh, we're able to f customize parts even further. So it's not just cutting the shape. It's also uh, you know, adding finishes, tapped holes, hitting specs you need, inspection reports, material certs, uh, you name it. I, I think even like you know, if you're doing defense export work, uh, we are ITAR shop uh, X1, our partner uh, for metal binder jetting, also is ITAR. So we're able to actually produce uh, produce parts for your needs. Uh, but it's all one place. You get instant quoting, uh, feedback, and if you need uh, need any assistance, please also reach out to our team because we have experts on staff to help out as well. 
I'm also going to point out free CAD add-ins. So if you're running Fusion 360, Inventor, or SolidWorks, you can also download a free CAD add-in under resources and get some of this instant coding experience right in your design stage. Um, also, we know that not everybody is instantly ready to order a part, but you may be in some phase of your design or you may just want to explore more. Uh, we spend a lot of time and effort putting together some really great design resources and knowledge-based resources uh, for all our technologies. Um, I'm highlighting some of these here, but it all starts with our resources page. Uh, so we do have a design guide for metal binder jetting that you can download right now and uh, take a look at it and learn some more uh, about the nuances of the process. Um, also, our capabilities page is just overall a great place to start for any one of our processes. We try to make that like a you know one-stop area for, for most of your questions. So check that out. And if you like novels, uh, check out our complete guide to 3D printing, uh, again, under, under resources. Uh, and that has uh, different chapters and bases. So whether you're just getting started with 3D printing, you want to know, you know why it's 3D printing over CNC machining, or you want to go dive deep into individual process classes, uh, check it out. It's, uh, it's got a lot of information there uh, for you to learn and, and learn more about different, uh, different technologies out there. Because 3D printing is not a thing, it's an umbrella of different technologies. Uh, if you are already with Zometry and you know someone who may be interested, we have a fantastic referral program. It's uh, the Give 50, Get 50 program. So if you were, if you go to zometry.com forward slash refer, or is there's actually a link called Earn Credits in the upper right hand uh, of your browser if you're logged in, uh, you'll get a referral link that you can share with your colleagues. Uh, if they log on and they order, um, they will are they will first off have fifty dollars of credits that they could use against their first order. When they order, you get fifty as well. Help pay for your prototyping. So with with referrals. So that's what I would recommend there. And yeah, it's time for some Q and A. Uh, so please, uh, um, as it like as we're talking, if you have any more questions, keep them coming. And you know, I think we have you know a good amount of time to to run through a lot of these. Uh, so again. If, I do, if we're not able to get to the end of these questions, uh, we'll still answer them offline as well. Uh, so my first um, my first question that I, that I have through here is about shrinkage rates. Um, but this is more about shrinkage rates for me as a designer. What should I be compensating for? So like, uh, are, they consistent, are they consistent throughout the part? Um, or should I be compensating holes differently than the overall X, Y, Z of this? And what should I be thinking about from my design perspective with shrinkage rates? Yeah, great question. Um, so, you know, we'll we'll cover majority of that overall ratio of shrinkage. Uh, we will scale up in the green body part in order to cover for that. Um, but obviously, there is you know deviation in the process, which is why we have that one or one percent. Um, think about your deviation in the print in the print bed. Then you got thermal operation, which is another stacked up deviation. Um, so we'll cover that aspect. But when it comes to IDs, there is essentially no outward force during the centering process. There's nothing constricting that ID from continually so, shrinking. So like that's, that's that's internal features. So if I'm like zooming in here, like it, whether it could be the internal diameter of this hole, or even you know this for example is designed to accept a square piece. It, I'd be talking about potentially these the internal distance from the square edges. Correct. Correct. Yeah, yeah, I would expect that to go another, you know, 0.5% smaller than the overall shrinkage factor. And it really because there's, there's nothing forcing it out. What's what's nice about that, that, you know, essentially gives you, you know, it's not intended to, but it does. It gives you stock, you know, in order to ream the hole uh, out. And if you get a drill and tap a hole, it, it kind of helps that way. But, you know, if it is, our process is consistent, you know, pass to pass. So if you do a pass apart through and you say, okay, this is under by five thou, offset that geometry by five thou, and you'll see that consistency in the next round. That's that's absolutely what I've found too. When I'm tuning apart, uh, so sometimes, sometimes what, I, what I've done, because we talk about plus or minus 1%, I find an additive, I'd, I'd rather be, uh, especially in internal geometries on that plus side, because I'm trying to fit something in them usually. Uh, so something I may do in my CAD program is create my final design, uh, and I may open up a configuration. And under that configuration, I may do a couple things, like potentially scale up my part by half a percent or one percent, um, or and for internal geometries, doing a little bit of a move face or offset on that uh, can sometimes help uh, as I'm as I'm designing and tuning. Uh, there's 
uh, as, as Brandon noted, there's a you know there's a better chance for this to be slightly smaller on a shrink size than the overall x y x y and z dimensions. Uh, so if you have like an internal star shaped hole or square hole, I almost 100% recommend doing a move face or some sort of offset, even by a, you know a couple thou, just to open it up to make sure that even if it is shrunk, it's still on that plus side for you, so you don't so you actually use it later. Uh, all right, so I have a question about the time to process for binder jetting. I, and I mentioned this like, you know, from one part to, to 100 parts is kind of the same time. Uh, how does that, you know, how does that cost uh, reflect the additional steps, materials, and time? Like, so it seems like, you know, we have a, for example, 10 business day uh, lead time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it's, it's all about throughput realistically. Um, and it's all about, you know, printer time as well. So if you can if you can put a hundred parts in the printer, and it still takes the same amount of time as far as height as a, you know a single part, you know essentially you can almost extrapolate that cost to be very similar. Less you know you have to also account for some of that volume of powder, the material cost. Um, but on the back end, the sintering aspect, it's almost as though you don't want to put one part in the furnace because it's going to drive your cost to the roof. You'd rather put a thousand parts in the furnace because then you can extrapolate that furnace cost across all a thousand units. Yeah, um, so the, go ahead. I was going to say, so like a lot of your, the printing is the unique part for the part, but a lot of your post steps are uh, standardized. Like to, so like you, you have, and I know you have this really cool conveyor furnace in your facility uh, for the 420i in particular that, uh, just basically runs crucible to crucible to crucible, uh, you know, slowly through this this conveyor step uh, um, as just part of your everyday process. Yeah, I mean that that furnace is essentially it's hungry, right? It needs to be fed constantly, <laughs> and if you're not feeding it, it, it runs 24/7. And as soon as we're not feeding it, it's essentially lost money, you know. So we we want to maximize a build box so that we can maximize the furnace as much as possible. Absolutely. Um, we talked a little bit about porosity issues, and so it's kind of a consistent porosity versus, you know, which, what you would find in, in casting where there may be like a bubble or some some strange behavior there. So, uh, but if there's any more questions on the person who asked that question, uh, asked that, please feel free to reach out and I can, uh, we could expand on that further. Um, so I have a question on the mechanics. Uh, does binder jetting have similar fatigue performance compared to DMLS? Uh, or any anisotropy uh, in its properties from the layering and build direction. So since it, and that, and I, I want to answer that question specifically more around the single alloy, so the materials line up rather than the infiltrated product. Mm -hmm. um, so keep in mind you're using powdered metal in both aspects. And what gives us a more isotropic, you know, material output is going to be the fact that we're going to the centering process. And it's doing this, you know, uniform shrinkage all at once, and essentially your particles are uh, going pre-liquid phase and necking together. So that's 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 your strength, that's your structural support. Whereas you're not utilizing layer where laser rather, where it's you know hot, it's not hot and then cold, hot bed, cold bed, hot bed, cold bed, which could cause a DLAM issue. Um, it's not to say that there's not DLAM in the process, you know, with, with finer jetting. That's more of a you know parameter setting than anything. Um, as far as you know where the mechanicals line up, um, it, it's still powdered metallurgy, so the, you know the elongation will probably be lessened over top of a you know just to say a forged product. Mm -hmm. But you know everything else you know should line up really really well on that single alloy product line. Yeah, and and you mentioned before that your target is a metal injection molding standard. Which kind of helps helps the industry acceptance of the product as well because we right. we have a you have a target and the behavior should be very similar to uh, to a MIM uh, standard there. Um, I do have so I saw a couple of questions come in about you know if I just build one part and you have to build big build area um, will it cost more for me? And the way that we're pricing these these parts out right now is assuming that these are joining their neighbors. So you'll find very economical pricing and the pricing is based off that unique part itself. And, and so you're gonna see the drivers are have to do with the geometry, for example, the size, how much stuff uh, is, this, is this part made of, uh, you know, the, the bounding box area of that part are gonna be the larger drivers uh, from a cost consideration. Um, 
I also had some questions about the patina and this range of color, colors. So these are this is not this is not plating, right? So on the on the six finishes that we have, uh, those darker patinas, they're they're just from a heat treatment, or is there is there any plating involved? That's correct. It's just it's a it's a kiln essentially, and it's all about time, and it's a a lesser time for that antique bronze and wheat penny, and a longer time for that Damascus steel and the new computer, which. You know, I wanted to say earlier is also my favorite, Greg. I, I love that Damascus still so much. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, so I also had some questions about uh, uh, lighter alloys and the they mentioned titanium and aluminum, which in my mind says reactives. Uh, uh, but uh, can you can you mention anything about reactive uh, materials? Hmm. Um, what can I say? So we you know, it's our process is capable, right? Our, the difficulty it comes into play that our equipment is open air. So you can essentially open the lid and watch the parts print. You don't have to be in an inert environment. Uh, obviously, when you get with these reactive gases, you do have to be in an inert environment. So um, we have designed and we are designing that environment. Um, we have publicly launched that we are capable of doing 6061. Um, other materials are potentially up and coming. I can say that, I guess. And it, so it's it's really all about you know just the making sure the equipment is safe in order for us to do that. Yeah, that, that and that makes sense too. And I, I think that like for those who don't know, the reason why I'm using that term reactive is um, for when I'm doing direct metal laser sintering, for example, powder metal can explode. Like powder, like powder aluminum can self ignite, so powder titanium as well. I'm usually running those in an argon environment. Uh, if I'm running those in DMLS, so direct metal sintering, that that chamber is actually doesn't have open air in it. It it has it's oxygen free, and uh, and so with what Brand is mentioning is that the way their design is, it's very you know it's it's very generalist design that allows you to do a lot of different materials from sand to metals, you you name it, these single alloy materials. Uh, but it also is, it's not in a chamber, right? So like you could put the machine in a chamber and inert that, uh, but uh, it's just something really to understand is there's a difference between me holding a block of titanium and holding, you know, powder of titanium. One of them, I'm going to be wearing a mask and what, and I also wouldn't want to be holding the material powder just so, you know, just open air uh, willy nilly. Uh, so it's just something to really understand there. Um, uh, question just on the on the uh, green stage of furnace. How do you, how do you ensure binder is burnt out completely? So our binder is actually only less than one percent of the overall geometry of the part. Uh, whereas if you look at metal injection molding comparison, they have you know I think it's upward to forty to fifty to sixty percent of their components actually binder. So that binder burnout is super critical. Um, so majority of that binder is actually already burning out during that curing stage, that catalyzation process. And then the remainder of the binder is burnt out during the sintering process. And that is done by a hold that's on the ramp up of the sintering cycle. That makes sense. Um, so I have, a, I'm gonna do a couple more questions and then anything that we didn't get to, uh, again, I'm gonna make sure that everybody's addressed. So if you do have any questions and you just wanna squeeze them in, uh, we'll address them after uh, after the presentation. But again, these I love these questions, it's so great. Uh, so um, this is going back to the furnace. Uh, when you're running that furnace, are you actually sharing a crucible? Like, are you sharing the furnace stage with multiple parts or is it just a person's uh, part at a time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, like I said, you want to fit as many parts in that crucible as possible. And if you look down inside the crucible, <clears throat> you'll essentially see a pole of bronze, a runner that comes up and attaches to sometimes 20 parts, sometimes 100 parts, and they can all be different. They can all come from different customers. It doesn't matter, you know, primarily. The times that we do have dedicated and specific runs are when we're talking about larger parts. And we're talking about customized stilts and runners and, you know, parts over like five inch cubes. Sometimes we have the, sometimes we have parts, you know, 15 by 10 by 10. And that's, you know, where it has to be in its own dedicated center and run. No, it makes, makes sense. And I just have, um, you know, one last question. This is about the fact that this is a metal matrix composite. And I'm, I'm reading this a couple ways. So if I, if I get this wrong uh, to the person asking a question, just 
uh, let me know, but it's, it's talking about, first off, you have porosity in this, which I just want to mention, it's that's it's very dense. Like if you cut in, you're not gonna, it's not gonna look like a speckled part. It's, it's mostly on the microscopic scale. Um, but does that affect some submersible properties? Like for example, on these stainless steels, do they behave like stainless steels uh, when submersed? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, I, I think I'm going to take the question maybe even a different way. I don't know. Yeah, take, um, take it in a different way. Yeah, <laughs> there's like there's like so four like, things in my mind on on that yeah. question. Yeah. So um, in, in my mind, I mean, the, the question is kind of if I am printing a cup and I fill this cup with water, is that cup going to retain the water? And the answer is over time, no. It's essentially going to weep out. Um, there are you know solutions to that. There's an impregnation process that was designed for casting that we utilize in order to stop that. Um, you just in a water environment alone, I would be, you know, I would want to do some type of passivation process, it's like a nitriding process, because the stainless steel and bronze essentially, you know, they're on the opposite ends end of this galvanic chart, which essentially just means what's oxidizing and what doesn't. And it can essentially, you know, have a, an oxidation that can that happens. That's great because actually our last question was if uh, of this question was if so passivation can solve the issue question mark which it sounds like we did. Hey, I thank you all so much again. I know we were a little over time, but these are just amazing questions. And Brandon, it's it's always a great opportunity to pick your brain on the subject of metal binder jetting. Um, really do appreciate everybody sticking around, and we'll answer any additional questions uh, uh, after this webinar, as well as there'll be a recording available for this. Um, so keep uh, stay tuned for that. Um, but just uh, uh, one more thing on my side, uh, we do have a code uh, that's been dis displayed on the screen here, TRYZOM25, T-R-Y-X-O-M-25, and that'll help save you um, save you 25 bucks on any order over $100. Give try give a try to Metal Binder Jetting, upload your 3D file today. And again, really want to thank X1 uh, and Brandon uh, for his expertise on, on building this. We're really excited about the product line. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you all so much and have a fantastic day.